Hey everybody and welcome back. So this is another video done by request and I'm going to read you this real quick email. Hey Dag, can you make a super simple video about wing loading and the cube wing loading that you discussed in other videos? The club I belong to is full of a bunch of old timers and they do not even want to hear about cube wing loading. They say the only thing that counts is your ounces per square foot and then it goes on some other things about he's going to quit the club and some problems he got with these old timers treating people like crap so i've done a couple of videos on this and something i want to i'm sorry i gotta reach for some other notes here um i i, I kind of want to explain you you know when when we think about an airplane and we think about the ounces per square foot, which I grew up on, okay? We would say how many ounces per square foot there was. And back in the late 80s, early 90s, well, I shouldn't say late 80s, all the way from about 79 up until about 1990 when I flew gliders and in and, and some glow planes, we never ever knew what wing loading was. It just didn't matter because we were building from kits those kits were already designed to be good flying airplanes. But when you started putting retract landing gears and extra servos and detailing an airplane, they started to become heavier. And I remember a gentleman telling me one time, if you're over 30 ounces per square foot, your airplane is going to start flying like crap. And it stuck in my mind. Now, this was back in the early 90s. And... Um, but I know today that I could fly a 55 ounce um, wing loading on a giant airplane and it would be as if it's a glider. And that's where the whole um, cubic wing loading came into. Okay, and, and I'm going to try to do this as simplistic as I can. So let's get into um, when, when you look at this chart here, this is a simplistic way for you to know how your plane will perform. And it was made only for RC, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But there are so many cubic, uh, or cube, yeah, cubic wing loading calculators on the internet that if you know your square inches of your wing and you know the weight of your airplane in ounces, you can put it in there. And it's going to give you your ounces per square foot, and then it's going to give you your um, cubic wing loading. And then when you look at that number and you put it against this chart, it, it gives you a really simplistic way to know how your plane is going to perform. But probably 90% of you out there, or probably less than that watching my videos, because a lot of people watch my videos are, are, are makers or creators or designers. But if you're building from a kit, this does not matter. If you're building from somebody's plans, it could or it might not. It, it might or it, it may or may not matter. If you're building a Zeroli P40, let's say, and you put retracts on it, all the bazillion rivets and all the stuff on it, and you get it to be a lead sled, using this calculator is gonna give you a really good idea on how that plane will perform. But if you went purely by the ounces per square foot, so let's say it had 38 ounces per square foot, and it's a P40. If you had a P40 with a 30 inch wingspan, that had that same ounce of per square foot, it would be almost unflyable. And I'm gonna dive into that a little bit more too in a minute. So uh, let me get this going a little bit here. So if you're new to my channel, I'm obsessed with giant scale airplanes and I design everything that's giant scale, I design myself. I don't do it from plans. I design my own plans, do my own CAD, my own 3D, all my own construction, test flying, everything. I'm obsessed. The plane's got to be at least 150 inches or bigger. I do fly ARFs and stuff, and I lo love them. But if I'm going to design something and fly it, it's going to be giant scale. And I love it. And I've had great success over the last 20 years doing giant scale electric. <clears throat> well, I shouldn't say electric. Electric's only been about 12 or 14 years. But giant scale... Um, I've been doing, well, I was doing giant scale back in the 90s, so it's been a lot longer than that. Before I go too far, I want to talk about one of my awesome sponsors, RTL Fasteners, and I am going to do a video on them. It's coming up soon. Um, if you need any of the bolts, nuts, metric, standard, anything for RC, um, 
they've got it. Um, I love the servos and screws. Um, I just got an order from them on a whole bunch of really cool things that I'm going to be putting on in my fro. I'm going to stein my big transport I'm building, and I'm going to kind of highlight why it's really it's smarter to go to RTL than it is just to go to most places and buy your bolts and nuts. And, and I'm going to dive into that. But right now, if you go to the website and you buy more than $50 of product and you use the top secret code DA30, you'll get 30% off your order. Okay. So when we start to really talk about, and let me make this bigger. So when we think about what is cube wing loading, Cube wing loading is a number which shows a reliable numerical value, which is used as a general start point on how a model radio control airplane will behave in the air. So basically what that's saying is, this is just giving you a, this, this is generally telling you how the airplane should perform, okay? Wing cube uh, loading is not dependent on size. This makes it easier to predict the overall flying habits of any RC plane. It serves as a reliable reference for the pilot's skill levels, which is needed to fly the plane safely and easily. So basically what it's saying is, <clears throat> if, if when you use the calculator, if it comes out to be a number four, it's going to fly like a glider or a slow flyer. Okay, if it's five to seven, it's going to be a train or a park flyer. So if you're new to flying and you build your own airplane and you have a cubic, I mean a cube wing load of uh, five to seven, you'll probably do fine. But if you're a beginner and you get something over 13, it might be really hairy to fly. It might be hard. But keep in mind, this was created only for RC airplanes. It was not ever used in full scale or anything I can find, okay? So, but I wanna show you something interesting here. So back in the day, I remember people saying, you could do 15 ounces, uh, uh, and you're gonna be awesome, 25 you're good, 35 is the max, and over 40 you're bad. And I couldn't understand why certain planes that had the same ounces per square foot but were different size wings behaved differently. Look at this. This was a very early calculator that still exists on the internet right now, but it said fighter planes shouldn't go over 25 ounces a square foot. So if you take what well, I was told back in the 90s, 40 ounces is the max, but here on the left, 25 ounces, I wonder why in the 80s and, uh, you know, 70s and 80s, they said 25 ounces. Well, most of the airplanes back then weren't 90 inch wingspans. Most of the planes back then were like 54 inches or 60, uh, I mean, 54 inches uh, span or a 60 inch span or maybe even a 48 inch span. They were small airplanes. But in the 90s, we upped that number. What was in the 90s, we started flying what was called IMAA, which means you had to be 80 inches or bigger. And on those airplanes, you could easily go to a 40 ounce wing load and the plane was still flyable. And so some people, and I'll talk about this at the end, created the um, cube wing load calculator. So you put in your area, you put in your weight, then you're gonna get a wing load in ounces, then you're gonna get a cube wing loading. And again, here's a reference to the way those planes would perform. But this should, in the most simplistic way, explain it the best, and hopefully this makes sense. If we were to build an FW190 with a 38 inch wingspan with 254 square inches, and it weighed 2.8 pounds, it would have a wing load of 25.51 ounces per square foot. Well, that sounds low, right? If you look at the cube wing load, it is huge. It's 19.2. That plane would be unflyable almost. Uh, unless you're a god like me. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm an average pilot. Uh, but the thing is, is then take this up to 94 inches. Same wing loading. Okay, and I'm talking about right down here in the green. Same wing loading basically, and the cube wing loading is 7.8. So we go from 19.2 at 25.5 ounces, look at the square inches, to this area, and you've got a seven. But most people would never build this airplane at 16 pounds. Most people build this airplane at 30 pounds. You're at 13.9. 
that is still at the top, but it's still considered a warbird or, warbird or racer. It's still a flyable airplane. Okay, so that, that's what's important for people to understand is that the people who created this formula, and it's not an exact formula, it is a reference for you to understand how your plane will behave in the air. Here's a better example. <clears throat> Here's my MSL-2. It's got 4,232 square um, inches. It weighs 61 pounds, has a 33.21 ounce per square foot, but look at the Q wing loading at 6.1. That is between a trainer or a park flyer, and if you've ever seen me fly this airplane, it flies like a freaking trainer. I mean, it's a little bit underpowered. I mean, I shouldn't say underpowered. It's powered like a full-scale airplane. You've got to fly it on the wing. You're not going to go vertical. Very few planes will go vertical on takeoff, okay? But what happens when we get silly here? If this was a, let's say a big P-47, okay? And it had 42, 30, uh, 4,232 square inches of wing, weighed 100 pounds, my, Q, my, my wing loading would be 54.44 ounces per square foot. But my Q wing loading would only be 10. That's of a sport or a scale model, okay? so. The bigger the airplane is, that's one reason I just did a video on large scale airplanes. The reason I like bigger airplanes is because they fly so much freaking better because they have low cube wing loadings. Okay. So what I want to do now is go back to here and I want to tell you, I looked through my notes and tried to figure out the first time I ever used a cube wing loading calculator. And it looks like in 2006 is the first, um, note I found that I use it for designing airplanes. I've had a couple of trolls come on my YouTube and say, this is nonsense, it's new, it's not new. Um, actually, I found an article by a guy named Francis Reynolds from 1989, and I don't know if it's the same Reynolds as a Reynolds number, I have no idea, but he wrote a really, and I'll try to put the links in this video to some of the stuff I found, but he wrote a paper or something in 1989 about cube wing loading. So this is not a new thing, but if all you've done is build from plans and build kits, you may have never needed to know about this because you're not a designer. You're not the one figuring out how big your wing needs to be or how, um, how your plane's going to behave. If you're building from plans, a lot of people will say, oh, that's 90 inches. You need to be at less than 40 ounces. That's probably right. 40 ounces per square foot on a 90 inch plane will probably be flyable. But if you have 40 ounces per square foot on a 30 inch wing, it won't be flyable. It, it, you'll probably need to be at 20 ounces a square foot for that plane to fly that small. So I hope this clears this up because I don't want to do another video about cube wing loading. I think this is probably the third one I've done on it. But the most simplistic way to think about this is, is if you've got a 30 inch plane with a 25 ounce wing load and you've got a 90 inch plane with a 25 ounce wing load the 90 inch plane is going to fly like a glider and the 30 inch plane might not even be flyable at all okay so the ounces per square foot is not a good rule of thumb to use if you're a designer of model aircraft or giant model aircraft okay so i hope this makes sense everybody i know this got a lot chattier and wordier than i wanted to get but I have a huge passion on trying to get facts out there so people can have success, okay? Um, a friend of mine built a ginormous, monstrous airplane that had a massive wing load, and a lot of people said it wouldn't fly, and it flew great, and it's because he had a 160-inch wing. That wing, when you put it in the cube wing load calculator, had, I think it was a 12 was the number on the cube wing loading, which is a flyable airplane. Okay. So, um, a lot of the questions I answer here come from my Facebook cause I've got like 4,989 almost at that 5,000 number. Where I can't have any more friends, <clears throat> but, um, keep the questions happening here on YouTube too. Cause I always post my videos here and then I share them on my LinkedIn sometimes, I share them on my Facebook, I normally post them earlier on my Patreon. So uh, yeah, so that's it everybody. I hope this helps you understand that I want you to be a builder and a designer. I want you to take your creative juices and build contraptions. But there's enough, there's enough um, tools 
out there that we can build successfully flying airplanes. And if you follow me anytime at all, you know I have an Excel spreadsheet calculator I created for knowing your flight, your elevator surfaces and rudder surfaces and your ailerons and all of that. Shoot me an email. I can send you that calculator because if you have a cube wing loading around 10 and you got your surface sizes right and you got enough power, you know, 70 uh, watts per pound or higher, your plane will fly. I mean, this is not rocket science. Um, there is science, but it's not rocket science. So take care, everybody. Make sure, I always end my videos, take a kid flying. Kids are the future of model aviation. All you old-timer, um, <clears throat> all you old-timer farts that want to run off the FPV, you want to run off the um, quads and drones and helicopters and gliders, you know, take your 800-pound P40 you never fly in your lawn chair and just take up golf or something. Just quit ruining the hobby for the young kids, okay? Rock on, everybody. Be safe. Take care, and I'll see you next time.